Welcome to Arkansas Wildlife. We've got a great show lined up for you this week. We're headed down to Southwest Arkansas and the Rick Evans Grandview Prairie Wildlife Management Area and Conservation Education Center, where we're gonna be chasing some monarch butterflies and find out how scientists, as well as citizen scientists, track the monarch migration. And a little later in the show, with duck season just a few weeks away, you may be wanting to do some work with your retriever. We've got a great place for you to do that. But first, deer seasons are well underway here in the natural state. So we're gonna tell you about some new chronic wasting disease regulations for deer hunting, as well as some new CWD testing options for hunters. All that, and this week's winner of a hunting and fishing license, right after this break. Arkansas Wildlife is brought to you in part by Academy Sports and Outdoors. For all, for less. Arkansas is entering its third deer season since the detection of chronic wasting disease in early 2016. CWD is a fatal disease that has been found in animals in the deer family in 25 states and three Canadian provinces. It's causing concern among wildlife managers and hunters, and here in the natural state, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission is managing the disease through testing and new regulations. We collected over 6,000 samples last year, which was more than double the year before, and so we got a lot more information about what's happening with CWD in the state. We know that we have it in three new counties, and because of the proximity, that means we've actually added five new counties to the CWD management zone in the state. So Benton, Washington, Crawford, Franklin, and Sebastian counties are all now included in the management zone. And also we've created a tiered carcass movement restriction. And what that will do is we've taken our four counties with our highest CWD prevalence, and we've made them almost a separate zone. We call them tier one. And what we're asking is that hunters only bring deboned meat and finished taxidermy products, clean skull plates, things like that, out of those four counties, even into the rest of the CWD management zone. And our goal with that is really to slow the spread of this disease. It doesn't make much sense to bring carcasses, intact carcasses, out of a high prevalence area right to the edge where we know we, we may only have a little bit of CWD at this time. And so just like last year, the rest of the C zone is referred to as tier two. You can move between tier two counties and into the tier one counties with higher prevalence, but you're going to need to debone your meat and only bring clean, low risk products out of the rest of the management zone into the rest of the state. And our goal with this, we know it's a little bit of extra work and, and that's not any fun, but our goal is really to slow the spread of CWD. Testing for chronic wasting disease doesn't stop at the CWD management zone. We are doing statewide surveillance. Our sampling strategy really has three parts. Um, we want to keep an eye on what's happening with what we refer to as apparent prevalence um, in the CWD management zone. So we are collecting samples from within that zone to monitor how effective some of our management strategies are going to be long term. We're also trying to provide a service to hunters so that any hunter statewide can have their animal tested. And then the third thing that we're doing is really, we do something called weighted surveillance. And the goal of that is to maximize our likelihood of detecting this disease if it occurs in an area where we don't currently know about it. And we do that by, part of it is our collaboration with taxidermists to sample older age class males. We also do 12 weeks of roadkill sampling, respond to as many calls as we can about sick deer because we know that's also where we're most likely to get the to find the disease in a new location. We use this weighted strategy statewide, year round, to keep an eye on what's happening and to uh, keep an eye out for new locations for this disease. Beyond its plan for rigorous testing and population surveillance, Game and Fish has adapted hunting regulations to manage CWD. We've removed the three-point rule throughout the CWD management zone. This does not force hunters to take any buck they're not comfortable with. You know, they can still harvest animals as they see fit. 
We know that bucks play a really key role in the transmission of the disease on the landscape. And there are several disease models and some field evidence that having male-focused harvest can reduce or, or stabilize the prevalence of CWD. We're hoping to you know, reduce the age class of our bucks uh, because older age class males have more disease. So by shifting back to a younger age class, we may have less disease on the landscape and we're also you know, targeting some of those animals that are most likely to move it long distances from our, our core area. The Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention encourages hunters to have harvested deer tested for CWD when hunting in a known CWD area and not consume any meat from CWD positive deer or any sick animal. Arkansas Game and Fish provides numerous statewide testing options for deer hunters, in addition to sample sites at Game and Fish offices and select taxidermists and veterinarians, Game and Fish now offers several drop-off containers for public use. The CWD drop-off uh, containers are located within the CWD management zone. There are 31, approximately two or three per county, located in areas that we feel will be easy for the public to be able to get to. And there's also an additional eight uh, located outside of the CWD management zone on a statewide basis that are mainly at Arkansas Game and Fish Commission regional offices. The first thing we'd like for you to do is to cut the antlers off. Once you take those off, cut about four to six inches of the neck off of the animal and take that head to one of those testing locations. You'll put that head into a bag, put a tag on it, and drop it into the freezer. You'll receive a tag that will give you the information for you to be able to check up on the results of that animal. Although wildlife managers still have a lot to learn about CWD, scientists are making progress in Arkansas and other CWD positive states. Everyone's always treated CWD as though it were a single prion. And we know now that there are different strains. And so we've partnered with Colorado State and other states to look at those strains and to see how they compare between different locations, which could give us an idea of, you know, maybe some of the details of how our how our strain of CWD can be expected to behave, if it's the same or different or where it even may have come from. Hunters play an important role in managing CWD in Arkansas. By testing their harvested deer and reporting sick or suspect animals to game and fish, hunters can help wildlife managers gain a better understanding of CWD. The, the more data that we can get, the more dots on a map, the, the clearer the picture will be of what CWD is in Arkansas. And I think that's the only way we're going to really make a difference on this issue is to continue managing it as best we can to slow it um, and to wait for the research to catch up. When you think of animals migrating through Arkansas, you probably think of ducks or geese flying south for winter. But there's another winged migrant that passes through the natural state each fall on its way to southern wintering grounds. And yes, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission monitors butterflies, and one in particular, the monarch. Well, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission is actually in charge of all wildlife. We are the trust agency for all wildlife species. And though you don't see butterflies on our logo, it is one of the things that we are tasked with managing. And the last 10, 15 years, there are a lot of populations of different butterfly and bee species that have been declining. The Rick Evans Grandview Prairie Wildlife Management Area in Southwest Arkansas provides an ideal habitat for numerous species of butterflies. And it's an important stopover point for monarchs on their way to Mexico. Grandview Prairie is our largest tract of native prairie that's left in the southwest part of the state. Grandview Prairie is actually a blackland prairie, which is a unique prairie type. It's got some unique flora and lots of butterflies because of all of the native uh, forbs and grasses that we have here. Grandview is also important for monarchs because they, monarchs, when they migrate south, they tend to follow what we call the I-35 corridor, which is in Texas and Kansas. So it's more of a westerly migration. And so the western part of Arkansas tends to see more of that fall monarch migration. In the spring, monarchs really are looking for milkweed. That's the only plant that the females are gonna lay their eggs on. 
And here we are at Grandview, which has a ton of milkweed. And so it's a great spot for monarchs. And in the fall, what monarchs really need are the nectar resources. They're traveling a thousand, two thousand miles to get to Mexico. They need fuel. So they're gonna stop where they can find nectar. And at Grandview, 2,000 acres plus of native forbs, it's a great spot for them. In recent years, the population of pollinators from bees to butterflies has been in decline. There's a few reasons that we think monarchs are declining. One of those is increased pesticide use, increased herbicide use, climate change. Um, a lot of farmers now are cleaning out their, their farms. They're, they're cleaning out all of the weeds that used to grow between the rows, and they're cleaning out the edges of the farm. So all of that weedy native growth is no longer there. Um, another reason that we attribute to monarch decline is the loss of milkweed, especially in the Midwest and the Corn Belt region. We're just not seeing the amount of milkweed stems that, stems that we used to have there. Studying monarchs requires keeping track of their migration and population. That's where the husband and wife team of Mike and Anita Briscoe steps in to volunteer. They've been tagging butterflies for more than 20 years. We had uh, attended a science workshop at Camp Clear Fort near Hot Springs, and Dr. Jim Edson was one of the presenters and he presented a program. He was at that time the Monarch Watch Coordinator for the state of Arkansas and he explained how people were catching the migrating monarchs headed back to Mexico and tagging them. We thought that sounded pretty interesting and kind of tie in with what we were beginning to do. So uh, he gave us some tags and we started tagging monarchs in 1997. Well, for one thing, it's helping out the monarch population, which has gone down over the past few years. They're trying to reestablish it to get it back up to its uh, highs like it used to be. And um, it's just fun to get outdoors. I don't hunt with a gun. I hunt with cameras and a butterfly net. But to me, it's just as much fun as somebody going out uh, hunting deer, duck, squirrels, whatever. It's just what my wife and I would rather do. For the Briscoes, the butterflies also provide an educational opportunity in the classroom. The best thing about doing it is we're both retired school teachers, and we still go back to schools. And we did this while we were teaching. We would bring monarchs into the classroom, sometime in the egg, egg stage, sometimes in the larva stage, and we'd let the students watch the butterflies emerge from a caterpillar from an egg, then go through all of its instars, then form a chrysalis, then emerge and become a butterfly. Then we'd get to tag them, and the students would get to tag them. After the monarchs are tagged in Arkansas, it takes a little time before they arrive in Mexico. It's, you tag all the tagging season, which is in the fall, and then you have to wait until, what, March or April before you finally get the information. Some years you don't get any. One year we had four, and so that was a pretty big year to get four of them. The Briscoes say they hope their work contributes to an increase in the monarch population. You know, it's always the thrill of the hunt and the pleasure when you get what you're hunting for. And so, and it, you know, when you're doing this, you're being, being like a citizen scientist. You're actually helping because you're reporting what you found? Well, they're pretty for one thing, just the fact that they're so pretty and everything, but the main thing is they're one of our main pollinators. If we're losing bees, we don't need to be losing any other insects, and so we've got to figure out how to save all of them. At Game and Fish, there's also a renewed effort to increase the amount of habitat for pollinators, and good habitat for bees and butterflies is also good habitat for many game species. We really started to look at our habitat management and think about pollinators when we're managing our areas. Right now we're under a really big push for quail habitat and that plays right in with monarchs because they need the same types of habitat. They need those open prairies and open woodlands with native forb species and native grasses. And we're also doing a lot of outreach, uh, getting people to plant natives in their garden. Uh, teaching people about maybe not mowing everything, maybe letting some things just sort of grow up and be natural um, and leave some of that good vegetation. It's really fascinating to think how far they fly. They fly 2,000 miles and they go to one little place in Mexico, even though they've never been there before. Those individuals are finding that one place in Mexico. So that to me is pretty fascinating. It's so fragile and you wonder how it flies like it flies just the complete change it goes through from the egg to the larva 
to the chrysalis and then becomes something entirely different from what it started. It's just, I like a little miracle every time it happens. Duck season is still several weeks away, but many hunters are getting a jump on the season at the Pepper's Pond Retriever Training Area. The recently renovated and expanded area is allowing hunters to prepare their dogs for real world hunting scenarios like never before. All those things that you run into when you're duck hunting a dog in the water that you can retrieve more birds. Uh, it's a conservation tool, so when they learn how to do all that kind of stuff, they're actually going to bring more birds back to the hunter. Pepper's Pond has been popular with retriever trainers since it opened in 2001, but it took a natural disaster and a unique partnership to make the facility better than ever. Following a 2011 tornado that ripped through the Camp Robinson Special Use Area, the Pin Oak Hunting Retriever Club approached the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission about increasing the training area size by expanding into storm damaged areas. That presented an opportunity to talk about adding additional area to the training area because we were having a lot of people here and it was getting crowded and we really needed the additional area. Today, the Pepper's Pond Retriever Training Area encompasses 26 acres, including five acres of technical ponds designed to challenge retrievers and handlers alike. I learned the value of all the uniqueness of these points and peninsulas and islands and things to teach a dog how to perform at its top level. And that's really what motivated this whole thing out here was to build something like that so dogs would have a place to train so the public could use it. The Pin Oak Hunting Retriever Club raised money and made in-kind contributions, while Game and Fish used existing resources to bring the project to fruition. The training area stays busy throughout the year and has played host to the Arkansas Retriever Challenge, a qualifying event for the Super Retriever Series Crown Championship. The annual field trial allows the Pin Oak Club to raise money for the continued operation of this popular training facility. We use this as a, as a, as a means of raising funds to keep the, the thing going and maintaining it and adding to it and expanding it and that sort of thing. The facility is near and dear to McMurray's heart, not only because it's been a labor of love, but because the facility was renamed Pepper's Pond in memory of McMurray's outstanding retriever, Pepper. She was the first retriever in Arkansas to be not only a grand hunting retriever champion, but a master hunter. She passed 10 grands, got her upland hunter title. Uh, just a really nice dog. Uh, I, uh, she was just a, a wonderful companion. Training a grand champion or master hunter isn't easy, but with a facility like Pepper's Pond at their disposal, Arkansas trainers and their retrievers have ample opportunities to work toward that goal. Having people in Game and Fish that understand the needs of the sportsmen, uh, it, it's, it's helped us become a reality and, and we've always tried to do our part, you know, in the, in the retriever world to know this is a privilege. It's, 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 you can't expect something like this. You have to be willing to do your part uh, to make it a reality for everybody. Arkansas Wildlife presents the Watch and Win Giveaway. During each episode of Arkansas Wildlife, we'll give away an Arkansas resident hunting and fishing license. At the end of this season, we'll be giving away $500 worth of hunting gear with everything you need for your next hunting adventure. It's all provided by Academy Sports and Outdoors. Visit the Arkansas Wildlife webpage and enter at ArkansasWildlife.com. This week's winner is Tommy Fields from Salgahatchia. Congratulations and thanks for watching.